So yeah, ham is the back leg of a pig. We sort of all know that. But the ham universe is a little bit more expansive and complicated than that. Ham can refer to a fresh or also called a green pig leg. Ham can also refer to a pig leg that's been wet cured, dry cured, smoked, roasted, brined, blazed. There are different kinds of ham, like a Spanish jamon, country ham, a city ham, a holiday ham. You get the idea, the list goes on. And yes, it would entirely make sense to drop a going ham joke somewhere in this introduction, but I've consciously chosen not to. And that's mostly just because 2009 was over a decade ago. So in this video, we're going to make a classic American holiday ham from start to finish. So to me, a classic ham needs to have that gorgeous pink hue running all throughout the leg, which we will achieve by using curing salt. And I really like smoked ham, and don't worry if you don't have a smoker, I'm gonna show you how to turn a normal kettle charcoal grill into a smoke-producing machine. Lastly, like any holiday centerpiece, this thing needs to be aesthetically pleasing, which we will achieve by dialing up our ham with some amazing glaze. First, we're gonna cure the ham, then we're gonna dry the ham, smoke the ham, glaze the ham, and carve the ham. Yeah, we have a lot to do, so let's get started. To begin, we'll need one whole ham. Not the shank end, not the butt end, the whole dang leg. You can special order one of these babes from a good butcher, just ask for a fresh or sometimes called green whole ham. This ham weighs about 15 pounds, which believe it or not is actually on the small to middle end of the ham size spectrum. The ham starts at the larger butt end, then tapers down towards the shank end. If we were to continue down the shank end, we would eventually get to the trotter, which has already been removed. Next, use a sharp knife to score the ham. Score down to the fat cap, but do your best not to puncture down into the flesh itself. I'm giving this ham a large checkerboard pattern for two reasons. One, because I think the end result looks super tight, and two, because as the skin cooks in the low heat of the smoker, the skin checkers turn into these little pluckable cubes, almost like chicharrones or cracklins. And also, expect your ham to shrink a bit during the cooking process, just a heads up. Next up, we need to cure our ham. Grab a large container like this 22 quart Cambro and clean it out. To summarize, curing is the act of using salt to preserve food. Using curing salts to cure and thereby preserve meats is a technique that's been used since the Romans were around. We don't necessarily need to cure meats anymore, however doing so provides a certain delicious look and taste. It's the reason why ham and corned beef are so pink and vibrant. Without curing salt, a ham just isn't a ham. To keep this thing moving along, I'm going to provide all of my curing ingredient measurements and the math to go along with it below in the description. All said, curing salt isn't something you want to mess with without understanding how to use it first. Looks like it still has some broccoli residue on it. Which is exactly why I'm whipping out my trusty old high school scale. A lot of nostalgia there. Okay, so this is an important thing to talk about in the hamming process. So pink salt, this is not your everyday salt, and the reason it's dyed pink is so that you don't mistake it for kosher salt, everyday salt. A lot of kitchens call it different things. It's curing salt, it's pink salt, it's prog powder number one, prog one, whatever you want. This specific blend is about 6% sodium nitrite, 94% regular table salt, but that tiny little bit of sodium nitrite is actually enough to be harmful if used improperly, so it's very important that we weigh this out accurately and that you make sure that your ratios are proper. Do not mistake this stuff for pink Himalayan salt. Not the same thing. Now all we need to do is dump our pre-measured curing ingredients into water and create the brine. Make sure to use enough water to submerge the entire ham by at least a couple inches. The water that you use should be cold. And don't worry, we're going to mix this brine almost every day so the salts and the sugar will have all week to dissolve into the liquid. Once dumped, give the liquid all a good mix until most of the solids look incorporated into the water. All right, this is where it gets a little creepy. Now we're just going to inject the ham with some of the mixed brine. Injecting the ham with brine will both speed up the curing and brining process, as well as ensure an even cure all throughout. Using a meat injector, puncture the flesh in between the scoring, then slowly inject a full syringe of the brine. Repeat this process six to eight times on both sides of the ham. If you skimp on injecting, you could be left with a half-cured ham full of patchy brownish gray spots due to under-curing. After you're done pretending to be a doctor, submerge the ham into the brine, making sure that the ham is fully covered. If your ham seems a little buoyant, place a clean, heavy ceramic object on top to ensure that it stays submerged. Then pop the lid on the container and set it in your fridge to chill. Some time later, and it's time to attend to our ham once again. Most of the heavy lifting is finished. All we need to do now is move everything around a bit to make sure that the ingredients are dispersed in the brine so that our ham cures evenly. I recommend doing this once per day. 
Use a clean kitchen spoon or any other tools to mix up the brine. I find that using the ham itself to sort of slosh around the liquid works fantastic too. Okay, we are now past the halfway point of curing. To ensure an even cure, we're going to inject the ham with its brine one more time. Don't worry, this part is not that messy. You can keep the ham in its actual container for the injections, which is going to keep things a lot cleaner. Inject the ham again four or five times on both sides like we did the first time. Then cover her up and place the whole container back in the fridge once more. Look at us go, day seven. It is next Friday. One week from when we started this puppy. The good news, the curing process is complete. Nice work. Remove the ham from its liquid prison and place it on a sheet tray in your sink. Rinse the ham thoroughly with cold water, then pat it dry. Once dry, place it back on a rack, on a sheet tray, then it's back into the fridge, uncovered for another 12 to 24 hours. This last step is going to allow our ham to form what's called a pellicle. Basically, a pellicle is a thin layer of proteins that will allow smoke to cling to the meat better. Don't skip this step, it's important. You've already come this far, be patient, Padawan. All right, the day has finally arrived. It's time to smoke the ham. Remove the ham from the fridge. Oh boy. The ham is looking nice and dry and has had time to form a pellicle. Let's fire up the grill, or in this case, the smoker. Though we aren't going to fully finish the ham out here, smoking something this big does take time, so it's best to start early. To transform a charcoal grill into a smoker, lay in two bricks like so. This will form a little cozy bed to tuck our wood chunks into. Pour about half of a charcoal chimney's worth of coals into the brick basket, then lay in a metal tray or something similar to help catch any grease drippings. Pop a few chunks of soaked wood right on top of the hot coals, then sprinkle a few more cool coals over the top. Place the grate on, making sure to orient it so that the lever is hanging over the coals. Maneuver the lid so that the top vent is opposite side of the burning wood. This will drag the smoke over the meat. Also. Make sure that your bottom vents are cracked to let air in the grill. More airflow means a hotter grill, so control the temperature with your vents. Once the smoke is rolling and the grill is preheated to 200 Fahrenheit, plop your ham on the grates over the tray, stick it with a lead thermometer, and let it do its thing. Meanwhile, let's get this glaze made. To a small saucepan goes a cup of dark brown sugar, a quarter cup Dijon mustard, a half cup dark maple syrup, a quarter cup apple cider vinegar, half a teaspoon of ground clove, and a tablespoon of garlic powder. Whisk that up over medium heat until it comes together and reduce it down slightly. Three or four minutes should do the trick. <coughs> then set that aside, we'll come back to it later. A couple hours have passed. Let's make sure our smoker is at the right temp. Test the ambient temperature. Keeping a charcoal grilled turned smoker like this at the right temperature can be challenging. Do your best to keep tabs on it with a thermometer. You know, heat the grill up by widening the bottom vents or cool it down by shutting them. We're looking for a steady 200 Fahrenheit. Good night, ham. Let the ham slumber in smoke for another hour, then it's gonna be ready for glaze. After a few hours, once the ham is well on its way to Flavor Town, you can glaze it. I like to coat my meat two or three times while it's in the smoker. And if your drip tray looks a little dry, go ahead and fill her up with water, juice, or even some brew if you got it on hand. I like to wait about an hour in between glazing. The waiting period sort of allows the sugars to really bake on and give the ham that sexy Hollywood shine. Now, you totally could finish the ham in the smoker, but I like to finish it in the oven for temperature control's sake. After several hours outside, the smoke really has done its job. Plus, if you live in an area like me where it gets super cold, I highly doubt you want to spend all day and night tending to your meat in the freezing cold, especially when you have friends and family around. By now, your ham should read somewhere around 130 degrees Fahrenheit. From here, really just glaze the ham one more time, then place it in a 250 degree Fahrenheit oven. Cooking times vary by oven, size of the ham, and a lot of other variables, so cook the ham by temperature, not time. Cook it until it reads 155 Fahrenheit, which could take anywhere from one hour to a few more. Once the ham hits temp, remove it from the oven. If serving immediately, let the ham rest for at least 45 minutes before carving. I mean, you've come this far. Don't eviscerate the ham too early. We want it as juicy as possible. <sighs> 
Ham is definitely one of those all day cooking projects that I prefer to get done ahead of time if I can. If you feel the same way, pop the ham on a tray, chill it down in the fridge, and come back to carve it the next day. And that's a wrap. All right. Sort of, not really. As stated, I find it much easier to cook the ham fully the day before serving, then carving, then reheating and serving. She is pretty pretty. Okay, so before we actually carve into the ham, let's just check out basic ham anatomy. There are three bones we need to worry about. The shank, which is gonna be protruding out the end, the femur, which runs sort of like on a slant, and then the H bone, which runs sort of in an opposite direction slant. It's kind of annoying, but we're gonna work around it. I'll show you how to do it. Understanding the bone structure of the ham will help you figure out the carving situation. Begin by removing and reserving those beautiful little cracklin cubes. They almost look like little like Japanese curry roux cubes. It's personal preference, but I like to flip the ham so the inner leg is facing upwards because I find that the bones are easier to feel out. Using a sharp knife, poke around the ham until you feel the shank, femur, and H bones. Let the location of those bones guide your knife and do your best to cut out large chunks of meat from the ham. Ham separated from the bone and divided into larger pieces is much more easier to work on than slicing ham from the bone. And don't be afraid to sample some of that piggy. You just spent over a week creating this masterpiece. You've earned it. With this guy, there is a ton of meat still on the bone. So save this and we're gonna do something really cool with this later. Maybe make some soup or something. Set that big bone and the trim aside and begin cutting your ham into serving sized portions. I like to slice up some pieces steaky and others thinner. As you move along the ham, trim out any overly fatty or gnarly pieces of meat just so that the people you're feeding don't have to do it later. To reheat, dial your oven to the lowest setting it can go and place your ham inside until just warmed through. Then transfer it over to a plate and doll it up however you see fit. I'm tossing on some green herby stuff and pink peppercorns to harness that holiday energy. Mm. The first thing that comes to mind when I think of like a holiday ham are the cartoons from the 50s and 60s, you know, those steaming, huge, like ornate, decorated holiday hams with cloves, pineapple rings, cherries, the works. The second thing I think of is a real life ham, but yeah. So thank you, Tom and Jerry. This uh, video was pretty much directly inspired by you. Also, I want to give a big shout out to my homie, Chef Ryan Pfeiffer, my buddy, Matt Broussard, AKA a cook named Matt, and the wonderful crew over at Hofer Meats. Thank you for letting me pick your brain over the past month, month and a half about hams. Definitely would not have been able to made this video without you guys. So again, big hug, hug me, hug me now. Yeah, this video has gone on long enough. If you did learn something about ham, please be sure to finger pop your boy with a thumbs up. <laughs> Just give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe for more. I will see you beauties next week and happy Christmas, Hanukkah.